Good afternoon, everybody. This is Karen Lee Harrington with the Maine Health Data Organization. And it is 1 o'clock. Um, we'd like to start promptly, but I hear that there are a few uh, beeps. So I'm going to wait another minute, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> and while we're waiting to get started, if folks could mute your line if you're not talking, um, that would be great. And please don't put it on hold because we'll get the, the lovely music. Um, so just make sure you mute it. Don't put it on hold. And there's a chat feature, um, and we're going to ask that you use that if you have questions as we go through the presentation. And then we certainly want to address as many questions as we can um, as we work through the deck, and uh, we'll save some time at the end of the uh, webinar as well. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So again, welcome uh, to all of you and thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedules to spend time with us this afternoon learning about uh, some updates to uh, Chapter 241 uh, as well as some updates within um, the portal that you all work within when you're submitting data to the Maine Health Data Organization. I'm going to just take a few minutes and uh, walk through the agenda, which I think you can all see, and uh, hopefully if you're uh, on the webinar. We're going to run through just a few use case examples, because I think it's important that you understand that you don't just submit the data to us and it sits in a, uh, you know, uh, it's in, in a black box, I guess is what I would say, and is never used. This data is used by a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons, and I just want to share a couple of examples with you. Then we're going to take a few moments and talk about some clarification and changes, some changes to Chapter 241 specifically. We want to talk about the payer and LOS crosswalks, and then we want to spend some time talking about the annual updates. Um, and then the testing goals, uh, some instructions that we've put together, and the timeline. And then, uh, again, answer any questions that you might have. And please feel free, as we're going through this deck, to submit your questions via the chat uh, function. Um, and we will answer those uh, as, we, as we work through the deck. OK, so um, there are a few colleagues with me. Um, and I'm going to just talk for a minute about the use case examples, and I'm going to turn uh, the rest of the presentation over to Kate Mullins with our partner, uh, HSRI. So just quickly, a couple of examples of how the data is being used right now. Um, Maine Quality Forum, which is a state agency that's required to work with the Maine Health Data Organization in yes. promoting the transparency of healthcare costs and quality information on a publicly accessible website. And that website, some of you may have heard of it, is called Compare Maine. And you'll see the, the link to the website. If you haven't uh, checked it out, you might want to do that. Uh, but what the main quality form will be doing with the hospital data is we'll use it to produce some quality measures for public reporting that we'll be putting up on Compare Maine over the next year or so. All right. And just to give you a, a sense, since we launched Compare Maine back in October of 2015, we've had over 43,000 um, visitors to the site, and they're looking at, you know, over 270,000 pages. So lots of people are looking at that site, and it's important to us that the information is as accurate as it can be. So. What? Okay. If you want to. If somebody could put their phone on you, you're talking and we can hear you. Okay, super. Uh, then the um, second use case is the Maine Children's Alliance, and you'll see that they use the hospital data to measure the outpatient attempted suicide or self-inflicted injuries uh, for kids. Um, and the data that uh, they uh, pull together from the hospital data is then published in their annual Maine Children's Alliance Kids Count book. And then lastly, there's a group called Kaufman Hall and & Associates, and they use the hospital data uh, and integrate it with um, other uh, public health data sets to assist 
healthcare providers, um, several hospitals on the phone uh, use this group to um, understand how they can increase quality of care uh, that they're providing to their patients by uh, benchmarking um, their data to uh, other hospitals' data in the data set. So again, just uh, wanted to share with you that there are uh, folks using this data. This is just a small sample of how the data is being used. And if anybody is interested in, in more details around this, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate. And again, welcome and thank you for taking the time to be with us uh, this afternoon. Great. Thank you very much, Karen Lee. Hi, everyone. This is Kate Mullins with HSRI. I'm going to walk us through the remaining slides. Um, and I just first want to acknowledge that we're, I am going to be reviewing some information that we covered during um, a webinar back in November. So some of this will be um, a little bit of a repeat for those of you that were able to attend or, or listen to the, the recording. Um, there are a couple of points of clarification or changes that we will be going over. Um, this slide provides a summary. I'll just talk through that quickly and then get into the details um, of some of the changes that are occurring. So first, with the file layout, we just wanted to make sure it's clear that the total length of each record type, and each record type are the, the processor data, payer data, et cetera, no longer is uniformly 192. Um, you need to you know, follow the specifications in 241 for each record type. Um, and just want to make sure it's clear that they are no longer uniformly 192 across the board. There are two fillers um, in the IP and OP record type 30 that have different lengths. Um, so we just wanted to, again, make sure that's clear to those of you that submit both file types. We will be talking, um, again, through the new strategy for the location of service information that those of you who submit outpatient data provide. Um, we have made a, a change or an addition that for Place of Service Code 22, uh, we will be asking you to populate the location of service field when um, the place of service is 22. We've also um, made some uh, updates or clarifications to the actual location of service crosswalks that you'll be submitting. Um, we've clarified that the NPI information that we're looking for in that crosswalk should be that of the billing provider. Um, and also just want to make it clear that you know, we have provided a um, specific format that we'll be requesting for each of those crosswalks, and they will, if they do not follow that format, they will be rejected and, and we will be asking you to resubmit. Um, and finally, just a, a point to make clear, um, for the testing period that, that is opening up today, we will not be loading any um, LOS crosswalks, but we are happy to review um, those as you prepare them, you can um, contact the help test to work through that. So again, I'm just going to go through um, the changes to Chapter 241. I know many of you have been um, actively working on all of this in preparation for the test period that we are entering today. Um, so hopefully a lot of this is sort of um, familiar. Um, but please jump in if there are um, any outstanding questions. So um, as a summary, the, the changes to Chapter 241, um, there mostly there's a lot of clarification of language, just making sure that we're talking about things consistently um, and clearly updating terminology. Um, we've deleted some, some old information, um, updated the code list reference information, and there have been some um, addition of fields, and then removal of fields. So as you all know, um, these changes go into effect with the submission of your Q1 2018 data, which is due by June 30th, 2018. So the production portal will be available for the submission of those data files no sooner than April 4th, 2018. 
and we will be reviewing the full timeline later in the deck. So um, just to recap here, um, these are the, the new inpatient data fields um, in the new format. Um, we'll discuss some of these in a little bit more detail, but again, we're just trying to get some more information from, about the patient. Um, we're changing the way the payer name is coming in um, so that it, the full payer name can be submitted in your data files instead of needing a crosswalk, um, and there's also the, the new statement covered period from um, code as well. So regarding that, um, the beginning date for the period covered on the record is what we're looking for in this field, um, and it must be a valid date that is no later than the through date. In the inpatient file, we have deleted um, or removed a couple of fields as well. Um, as I said, the, where we, we've sort of cleaned up the way we're collecting the payer information, so the payer identification number is no longer necessary, and the old payer name field is removed as it has been replaced with a longer field. We've also taken out a few of the filler fields. And again, some similar updates on the outpatient side. Um, additional, collecting some additional information about the patient, um, replacing the payer name field, and we have a new field which is collecting the place of service information. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here on the next slide. Um, the place of service is a CMS code to indicate the specific entity where the services were rendered. Um, so this is mutually exclusive of what would be an OP4004, which is the type of bill. And we've included the, the link to the full code set um, here as well. On the outpatient side, again, deleted the old payer identification number, um, removed the old payer name field as it ha has been re replaced, and and also um, removed a couple of the filler fields. So as a result of these changes, we um, are making some changes to the crosswalk approach. Um, until these change, the Chapter 241 changes go into effect, we want you to continue to follow the current process, which is that submitters will need to submit their payer crosswalk for the following fields. Um, when there are changes. So um, information that we have obtained through these pair crosswalk has really allowed the MHGO to better understand and report data to, um, to their users. So we, I know um, at times this process has been frustrating, but we really appreciate all the work that you put into um, getting us accurate crosswalks and um, we just have a little bit longer to go um, before the, the new layout goes into effect and we're able to eliminate this crosswalk. Speaking of that, the future, which will go into effect with the submission of Q1 2018 data, means that we're eliminating the need for the pair crosswalk um, by replacing the previous 23 character pair name fields with the new longer 100 character fields. Um, so this will allow you to put the full name, um, the full or unabbreviated payer name in that field. Again, we're not looking for the plan name, we want the payer name in this field. And we really need this to be the normalized payer name, not something that's um, uh, not commonly known. So for example, we know BC, um, BS is a standard well-known um, abbreviation for our Blue Cross Blue Shield, but there are definitely others that we see um, in the payer names that um, do cause problems for us. So again, we're really looking for you to, now that we have the, the full 100 characters in that field, we want to see the full um, normalized name. And on the outpatient um, side, um, as you know, for those of you that submit outpatient data, right now what we, do, we ask you to do is to send um, a crosswalk for OP4005 
and um, this we're requiring you to, to fill this in, field in um, on every record. And again, until the new Chapter 241 changes go into effect, we want you to continue to update these as necessary. Are you doing that just once a year? So the goal with the new um, LOS crosswalk approach is really to allow data users to identify which services or encounters occurred at a physician practice um, in a standardized way. Um, we've been able to make um, use of all of the, the location of service information that you have provided. MHG has um, been able to identify approximately 850 physician practices using all the data that's been provided. Um, and now we're just trying to sort of uh, refine the, uh, how we're identifying these and, and doing it in a little bit more of a standard way now that we have a place of service field as well. So we do not need you to identify labs, um, hospital departments, or imaging centers. We are really just trying to focus on um, physician practices that may be in a, a variety of settings. So um, again, the, the, uh, the goal is to minimize the information required in the, the crosswalks um, because of the additional place of service fields. So what we're asking is that when that place of service field is populated with a subset of codes, so I've listed them out here and we're going to review them um, in detail, the, um, we're looking for when place of service is populated with 11, 17, 20, 22, and 22 is an addition from the last time that we reviewed this information in November, uh, 49, 50, 71, and 72. So we're saying that the OP 4005 field must be completed with the full name of the physician practice along with the information, and then we want you to provide the crosswalk. So here's some more detailed information about the place of service codes that we're um, requiring the LOS information for. So um, office, walk-in retail clinic, urgent care facilities, um, on-campus outpatient hospital, so that's 22, that's the one that we've added since the last time we talked. Um, independent clinics, federally qualified health centers, public health clinics, and rural health clinics. Again, we're really just trying to get some, uh, be able to identify the physician practices in a number of um, different settings. So again, with the, the submission of your Q1 2018 data, we'll be asking you to um, provide your crosswalks that will be used for the data intake validations and then also um, that information then gets passed on to our data users as um, needed and, and unless there have been changes to what um, you submitted initially in that with your Q1 2018 um, data, we're only asking you to, to submit it on an annual basis. So here's the template for um, what we want the crosswalk to look like. And again, um, unless there is, um, we're, we, we really need, in order to, to standardize um, the, the loading of these, we really need these to come in in a, a standard format. So we will be expecting um, all crosswalks to come in this format, and if they do not meet that, um, these requirements, we will be asking you to uh, make revisions and resubmit. So um, each column is described here. We're first looking for the, um, the code, the name, um, some address information, and finally, we're looking for the billing NPI um, of the entity that's providing, uh, the, well, of the service location. So is that the same crosswalk you've already done, or was that insurance you said? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, you want to uh, keep going here? Um, so the next section is just to go over some annual updates in addition to the Chapter 241 
changes. We um, have a number of updates that we um, will be performing, and this is some. These are things that we'll be doing on an annual basis as we go forward. We have yet to do these um, in this new system um, since we've been um, just giving people, um, you know, a, as much time as possible to sort of stabilize and get comfortable in the new system. This is our first chance to um, do these annual updates and, again, effective with the submission of 2018 data. Um, we'll be making changes to both the inpatient and outpatient validation rules. We'll also be performing what we call our annual override reset, and this means we're going to be um, sort of resetting, uh, if you have existing exemption or profile overrides, we're going to be resetting those. Um, and then finally, we're going to be asking you all to perform what we call our annual registration updates in the portal. Um, you'll be going in um, to review some information in the portal, verifying it, and making updates as needed. So here's just a summary of some of the validation changes that we will be making. Um, on the inpatient side, we've um, made additions and removal to accommodate the Chapter 241 changes. We've also um, made some changes to the ICD-9 field validations. Um, you, we, what, what we're doing now is that we're working under the assumption that most people are will not be submitting ICD-9 data any longer, um, and we'll be performing a check um, of those fields. If, you, if there is a valid reason to be submitting ICD-9 data, um, you will have the ability to override that issue and explain um, the reason for that submission. The check is really in place to prevent any kind of um, data entry or data pull um, you know, mistake where maybe somebody's putting an ICD-9 code in the ICD-10 uh, ICD code in the ICD-9 field by accident. On the outpatient side, again, making some additions and removals of rules to accommodate the changes in Chapter 241. And then we'll also be modifying the logic we um, use on the, the location of service field to accommodate the new approach to um, this field in conjunction with the place of service field. And as I, I mentioned, the, the other thing we'll be doing, um, as of March 30th, 2018, all um, existing profile and exemption level overrides will expire. So submissions that happen after that date um, will be evaluate, evaluated against all validation rules. Um, and new overrides will need to be submitted based on those results. Um, we do this on an annual basis um, to make sure that we're reevaluating um, how data are performing across all of our checks. Um, <clears throat> so there will be a, a little bit of an administrative burden um, on that first submission, but once you get through those issues, especially the profile ones, you'll be good for the remainder of the calendar year. Um, and then finally, what we'll be asking you to do is just to review some um, information in the portal about your um, hospital, your contacts, and your users. Um, during the month of April, you'll need to complete those updates in the portal, um, and we'll be providing detailed instructions of exactly what we'll be asking you to do um, as we get closer to that date. So. Um, I'm going to review the screens that we'll be asking you to look at, but again, we'll be providing more detailed instructions um, in, during the month of April. So um, this is just an example of up here in the um, portal. You'll go to the summary screen, take a look at the information we have about your um, hospital, see if anything needs to be adjusted. We'll ask you to go to your contacts that are listed in, within the portal, um, make any adjustments or updates here. This, these, uh, this is the list of, that we use when we send out um, information about events like this um, or other updates regarding um, 
the submission of these data, so it's important that this is kept up to date. And then finally, we'll be asking you to look at if the, your users. Um, the users are the folks that have um, access to log into the portal and submit data. So again, we just want to take the time to make sure that um, this is accurate, especially if there's somebody in your um, group or organization that has left the team that submits data or the organization, we want to make sure we're cleaning up um, users uh, as needed. So next I'm going to go through um, what we will be um, asking of you for the testing period that's beginning today. And um, again, the goals of this testing period are for you to submit um, inpatient and outpatient files in the new Chapter 241 file format. We also want you to go in um, after those submissions to view the validation issues that are um, being brought up on those submissions, and that will help you determine what might need to be addressed before the submission of production files in April. We do want you during this testing period to successfully resolve any structural validation issues, and these would be the ones that um, <clears throat> primarily would have to do with the Chapter 241 changes. We want to make sure that um, we're working through those issues early. So it is not required that your files be in a path status uh, by overriding non-structural validation issues as part of this testing period. So I'm just going to quickly walk through the, the, the steps you'll be taking through for the testing period. Um, and these instructions with more, a little bit more detail have been distributed. Uh, they're also made, been made available on the MHDL website, and we'll review where that is um, at the end of this presentation. Um, and I did see at least one question asking uh, about this presentation. This will also be posted on the MHDL website and made available, um, as well as a recording. For the, if it, um, there are others in your organization that are unable to attend. All right, so first step will be, of course, to log into our um, test portal. So we have a separate um, hospital data portal that you'll be using to perform your testing. We include the link here, um, and you will notice when you log in that things uh, the coloring is a, a little bit different just to help you distinguish um, where you are in terms of whether you're in the hospital or the production portal. Um, and you will be able to use the same credentials that you use for your production portal uh, login. If you do run into any problems logging in, please just contact our help desk and we'll work through those issues. So once you log in, you'll be on, um, submitting the um, inpatient and outpatient data through the portal. Um, what we just ask is that you can submit any time period as long as it's less than a year old. Um, if it's more than a year old, what happens is there's a um, submission period locked issue that, that gets flagged, um, and that will trip you up in this case. So you must still use the correct file naming conventions um, or you will receive a structural failure as well. Once you submit your data, um, you'll uh, then be able to log in and view that um, file in your submission history. So the, the average file takes under 15 minutes to validate um, and that's when you'll be able to go in and begin re reviewing all the validation issues, if there are any, by selecting the details. Um, we're just asking you, again, to make note of these issues um, that need to be addressed before production submissions begin in April. Um, and if you are unsure of the results that you're seeing for your test files and what it would take to um, resolve them, please contact our help desk. Um, we will happily walk through um, the results with you. And again, really uh, the, the only issues that you need to resolve um, during the testing period are the structural issues if they exist. 
So um, if they, they do exist, we ask that you try and um, resolve them on your end and resubmit those as well. And again, I think I mentioned this earlier, but we will not be loading any LOS crosswalks during this testing period, but you are welcome to um, start running them by us by um, sending them to the help desk for review. Um, and just a, a couple of reminders that were included in the testing instructions as well. Um, system notifications will not be sent out from this test portal. So that means when you do submit your file, you will have to just keep an eye on it through the portal to when it finishes processing. And files that are submitted through the testing portal will not be moved to production if they are successful. And by successful, I mean uh, if, if they do pass all validations and reach that, that pass status, um, they will not be moved. All right, so here is the timeline um, for the next few months. Um, the first item is that um, I know all of you are working on your Q4 2017 data files, and those are due in the current old Chapter 241 format by the end of March. We had our webinar today to review this information and the testing period that um, we'll be holding in this with the new um, test site will, is open to you now and will run through March 9th. We do ask that everybody participate um, and get and submit each file type that they submit in production. So the last day that files for any period will, that will be accepted in the old Chapter 241 format will be March 30th. And files submitted um, between April 1st and April 3rd are going to be held until we implement all of the changes. Um, so you, you will be able to upload those files uh, through the portal, but we will not validate them until we implement all of our um, format and validation um, and override resets. So on April 4th, you can begin the submissions of new Chapter 241 formatted files. So this will be your Q1 2018 data and any, um, uh, any, any data that needs to be submitted after this time period. So like if for some reason you had a December 2017 file that needed to be submitted after April 4th, it would need to be in the new format. And then, again, during the month of April, we'll be asking you to perform some updates within the portal, review your summary, contact, and user information. And then all Q1 2018 data files are due in the new format by June 30th. All right, so um, I'm going to Stop sharing here so I can go look at the chat. Um, I did see a number of questions come in, so I'll pull that up now. And I guess um, while I pull that up, Karen Lee or, or Kim, please, um, if there's anything I missed that you want to add, please feel free. Hi, this is Kim, Kim Bonson, the uh, Compliance Officer for MHCO. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for uh, attending today and um, look forward to working with you. We're hoping that this testing period will be um, successful and uh, we're here to answer any questions you might have. Um, the help desk is there for you and uh, I believe most of you know my email and my, or my phone number, so feel free to contact me as well. Uh, Dave Vincent is always uh, available for technical assistance, too. Um, so again, thank you for attending today. So I'm, I am seeing a number of questions about the um, requirement to provide the NPI in the location of service crosswalk. 
Um, I think um, what we should do um, on our side is MHGO and NHSRI will have a, a little bit of a conversation and provide some clarification and guidance around that um, since there seem to be a number of questions on that. And um, another question I see is that um, whether files during the testing period should be from your own testing environments. Um, I think that that's up to you um, how you want to um, pull together a, a test file for submission. Again, the goals are really just to make sure that you're able to submit a file in the new format and begin to understand what um, the results of any new validation changes might be. So I think you want it to, whatever file you submit and the data to be probably as close to production as possible just to ensure that you're not getting many surprises um, in April. And, and then I see some questions just about the timing of the testing period and your own um, internal work to, to get these changes implemented, work with outside vendors. Um, so while the official testing period will end on March 9th, um, it's I expect that we will leave the, the test portal open and available to those of you that may need to continue work um, in testing this out with other vendors. Kate, are there any other questions in the chat room? Um, I don't think so. I think we're coming to an end here. Does anybody on the phone have any questions that you'd like to ask? This is Katie Kimball. I'd actually like to ask a question about why the patient name is being required for 2018 and how is that not a HIPAA violation for the hospital? So <clears throat> we are uh, asking for the name and some more identifying information so that we can build a master patient index and all the information that uh, you know we take in is protected under um, the same requirements although we don't have to comply with HIPAA uh, we do comply with HIPAA so um, we are authorized to, by law to take this information in and protect it, and we do we do not release individually identified data um, unless it's gone through a process with our board and it's met all the criteria required in our uh, laws and rules uh, to release. And those are under highly um, defined circumstances. So I'm happy to put something in writing um, if, if that would be helpful, but this is uh, allowable under our structure and statutes. I, I would actually love to have something in writing so I can have our HIPAA compliance officer look into it for me. No problem. I'm fairly Thanks. certain that we're going to look for um, one of our own HIPAA contracts with you, is that something you're willing to do? Uh, enter into like a business associate agreement? Yes. I, you know, I will, we'll need to talk about that. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll want to get the lawyers uh, involved in that discussion. Again, I, let me put something in writing to you all that you can share with your internal folks and then we can talk uh, as needed offline. Okay. Are there any other questions?
All right. Hearing none. Kate, no more in the chat room? No. Normal. All right. Well, again, thank you, everybody. And uh, the presentation and the recording will be on our website uh, in a few days. And uh, if you have any questions, just let us know. And we'll be in touch with the follow-up. Thanks. Bye.